here we are at the Laurel Hill Furnace. This is in Westmoreland County on uh, Baldwin Creek in St. Clair Township. A little controversy, this furnace, some people say this furnace was around and uh, went out of blast in the 1850s. The article I'm reading says uh, 1860s. In any case, very, very nicely preserved cast iron furnace. Um, this was a cold blast furnace. So this was, uh, it would be charcoal. So basically all the wood around here would have been gone. Um, over here's a plaque. Let's get to the plaque and show what's on that. Again, what we're looking at, I think the article says this is a, a unique furnace because it has four openings. Most have two or three. So you probably can't hear the stream in the background, but this would have been, uh, water would have pushed a, a wheel. The water wheel would uh, be used to operate a bellows, sort of like a, a forge, or when, when people see that at an old fireplace, that bellows would have uh, blew air in through here, and that would have charged it. So they would have filled this whole thing up with charcoal, uh, cast iron, iron ore, and um, limestone as a flux. You can see the top of this. Again, it's very nice, very, very well-preserved furnace. Lined on top, you can see the... Um, the pins on here that were used to hold this together. Not sure if that's original or not, but that's all part of it. I mean, the furnace is well lined. It's just in great shape. We're going to get some more pictures of this and uh, try to explain how this thing operated. This is the right side of the furnace. Let's we'll see if this is the bellows side or not. Um, I would consider them all harps. Again, real nice little tree growing out of the top of that. Hopefully, they get rid of that. But I'm gonna make sure I stay on the right property here, so I probably won't be able to film this all the correct way. But up on top of this hill would have been a ramp. That ramp would have went all the way up to the top of the furnace, called the, the, the charging ramp or whatever. There would have been a wooden structure over top of this. This furnace would have run 24-7. This thing would have run constantly. They would load it up with charcoal. I guess we'll take a step back here. So the inside of this furnace would have been lined with brick would have been a temperature resistant brick, it wouldn't melt. Um, the diameter of this, I don't know, 8 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, would have been called the Bosch. We'll get a closer look inside here, you can actually see. This portion, if I get my finger to it, right here, that portion's where the air would have gone in, one of the blowers, or the cast iron would have come out. I'll have to figure that out. A very, very well preserved furnace. You can see a couple concrete blocks in the in the ground up here. Let's get to this one. This concrete, there are four of these sunk in the ground. That would have been used to um, put the four by fours or whatever roofing. This whole front would have been covered. This side would have been covered. Uh, there's a wheel pit which is where the water, you can see that there's a stream across the, the farmer's field over here. That stream would have been used to run the bellows, and from what I understand, there's a four-foot tunnel that was dug someplace underneath here because there wasn't enough head or height of the water, so they had to dam this, and I guess further downstream, this uh, little tunnel emerges. I don't think we'll be able to find that, because I'm assuming that's on private property. But on this side, we have a couple, a couple uh, we see a foundation here against the wall. And that's one of the buildings used for the furnace. Anything that was in wood would be gone. Anything uh, concrete would still be standing. So a lot of times the Iron Master's house would have been made out of brick. That was still standing. Thank you, Mr. Rooster, for letting me know what time it is. Tell we're pretty far out there. Um, this would have produced, I don't know, a couple hundred tons of uh, cast iron. Again, these things went out of business. This, this says, again, mid middle 1800s is when this was used. This was donated to um, the Ligonier Valley Historical Center. Again, they've done a very nice, very nice job of, of it. Um, there's a link here on Richard Park's website if you want a little more history on this. He's got some nice pictures. He's actually gone through and, and taken some uh, photographs of these. There's also a book, um, Sharps and William, Myron B. Sharp and William H. Thomas put out a guide to the old stone blast furnaces, western Pennsylvania. That was done in the mid-60s to try to document a lot of these, because a lot of these furnaces are falling apart. 
not much left of them. This one's in good shape, but eventually, uh, I mean, hopefully they'll keep this going. But a lot of the other furnaces I've been to are uh, falling down, so I'm trying to document as many of these as possible so that uh, at least you can see what they are. Again, this is, this is what made Pittsburgh so great, is the, the cast iron. What we see here, just scattered red brick, like you'd expect to see in a house. This is the, the clay. This would have been the inner lining of the furnace. This would have taken a lot of heat. You can see some, some blocks over here. We've got some dark on it. That could be smoke. Looks like this is open. Yeah, so this does have three sides. You can see an opening over there. We'll get a better picture of that. We'll get up a little closer. So here we are inside the hearth area. And again, I don't know whether this side was the charging side. I see some coal here. Uh, I see a lot of brick, which again would have been the inner lining. I don't know if the inner lining is still there. That's This is very nice. This isn't in a lot of the furnaces. A lot of furnaces uh, you can't even get into here to see this. But this is very, very well preserved. Very, very nice furnace. We're happy with this one. So this is the front of the furnace. I'll try to get a little further in here to get some pictures of this. Try not to get too, too close. I think I can actually get in and get, um, uh, get some video looking up. So this is really nice inside here. You can see the outer, the inside of the outer portion of the wall. And this round piece here, I figure here this, inside here, this is where the, the molten cast iron would have been. So we'll get the camera in there, we'll put the, put the book down and get in here a little bit closer. So this is really inside this furnace. It may not be as good a picture, but this is as good as we're going to get. You can actually see the gap in there between this. This would have been filled up with um, any brick. That's all the slag and sand and stuff that we see out here. But this is the actual Bosch. What would have been the inside diameter. So this is where the molten steel, molten cast iron, sorry, molten steel. This is where the molten cast iron would be. And you can see, going all the way up, you know, 25, 30 feet, where this was lined. Probably not the safe as being in here. But there's also tapers going up to the top. Again, I don't know how long this is gonna be around, but this is all, would have all been stone on the outside, it would have been brick. And then on the inside here, where's my hand here? This is all slag. So this is all, all would have been left over from one of the pores. And again, this thing would have just been constantly run. We can see some more slag here. I would imagine this was either where the air came in or where the cast iron went on. I'm not exactly sure which one. I can have that on this side too. I'm really surprised they let people in here. I don't know how safe that is. Very, very nice, very unique. Not, not many people get to see the inside of this furnace. Here you can see how, how wide, how long thick the bricks are. So this is the inside of the hearth on the left side. Be a little bouncy until I can steady the camera. And so we were just in there. You can see the other side. I, I believe that's where the... I don't know. I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at that one. I'm not exactly sure. So here we are on the left side of the furnace. Again, this has three sides. Why it's at four. This had three sides, which is different. Again, just a different view. You can see how all the bricks were, blocks were laid into place. And then there's a nice plaque here. The plaque actually explains who did what and what this is. So this furnace took about, from the plaque, took maybe 15, 20 men to operate it. You would have an iron master. Again, which one of these houses around here would have been the iron master? Iron master's house. You would have uh, loggers. People needed to cut the trees. I mean, most of the trees are gone already. But looking at some of the pictures from Penn State. Penn State uh, University has done a nice job at capturing some of the old black and white photos. And if, if you look at those, a, a panoramic here, you know, you see trees back then, there would have been nothing. There would have been no trees, nothing. All that would have been cut down. What they would have done is they uh, 
cut the trees in maybe 10 foot sections, 15 foot sections. They would stack them up, um, sort of like a teepee. Then they would cover them with dirt and they would light it on fire, basically make charcoal. What they're doing is they're burning the impurities out of it. Didn't matter whether it was hardwood or softwood, all that wood would go in and they would have a stack of that. You would also have molders, guys that would um, be standing outside here waiting for the cast iron to be molten and ready to pour. Again, this is the, uh, this is what I call the business side of it, the hearth. This is where the cast iron would have come out. So they would unplug it. Once they'd done that, you know, horn blast or, you know, shotgun shell, so something like that, letting everyone in the area know what's going on. And um, the molders would come and, you know, th this whole thing would have been, this whole area here would have been under, under roof. And the men with the patterns, the sand, uh, you know, the cope and drag would have had their patterns ready. And what they would have poured would have been um, like Franklin stoves, anvils, um, and any type of cast iron utensil. And um, this would have been sent to even, you know, even the local blacksmiths would have used that. And they would have forged that down, hammered that down, and made um, wrought iron from it. And they would, the, the local men here would actually be making tools, you know, plowshares and things like that, sickles and size and, and things to work, pots and pans. But, you know, cast iron skillets and stuff, that would have just been a normal, um, just a, a normal cast. A nice furnace. Get a chance to take a look at it. I'm not sure there's much to add. Very, uh, very, very nicely preserved furnace. Get a chance to take a look at it. Go ahead. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you like it. We have a couple more of these videos coming. Uh, once all these ones with the structures in place are done, I'm going to go through and I'm going to start capturing the, um, basically, just the remnants where there's a little bit of a Bosch or a little bit. Again, I think it's important to, to preserve this history. Uh, Richard Parks did a nice job in 2000, and um, the, the other books that have come out on this are, um, are good. I think it's important to remember the history of uh, Pennsylvania and the history of iron. You see a lot of this area. It looks like a maybe three foot foot hill going around here. All of this is slag. So charcoal is going in. The, uh, the cast iron, the, the, the cast iron that wasn't successful when they poured it or uh, just the raw iron ore plus uh, limestone again would be charged up on top through that ramp on the back called a charging bench. The cast iron, I believe the cast iron would have come out the front here. So the cast iron would have come out the front they would have just dug a pit in the ground and then whenever they blew the furnace they would basically pull the cork all the cast iron would come pouring out into like a, a, just a hole in the ground with branches coming out and that would fill it up and what that looked like from the top that like they actually looked like pig suckling and uh, that's where they got the name pigs well we call them ingots or blooms now those blooms or ingots um, thousands of pounds each maybe you know two thousand pounds maybe a ton would be um, sent by river, sent by, uh, most of the time by river, into, into Pittsburgh. And then Pittsburgh would have taken them at the blooming mills and they would have uh, hammered and hammered these things until they were went from cast iron to wrought iron. Remember, cast iron is very brittle, high in carbon, and when you pound it, um, you're basically aligning the structure and you're um, making it more wrought iron. Wrought iron is more usable in tools, plows, knives, gun barrels, and things like that. A new laurel furnace, very nice furnace. You get a chance to come out and take a look at that. Please do so. Um, thanks for watching.